Hi, and welcome to Our World War II Dad. I'm Chris Cangella, and joined as always with my brother, Ken Cangella. And first of all, we want to thank you all for watching and listening to this podcast and the episodes we've put out so far. We really appreciate that you've done that because we're sharing stories about our father, Private First Class Louis T. Cangella, who was in the Army in World War II over in Europe. You know, and if you're just listening to the podcast, we highly, and I mean highly recommend that you go and watch the YouTube version of this same episode because we're putting in a ton of photos from uh, that dad had that we learned about um, and then also the stuff that Ken shot when he was there. So let's let's really check out the visual because you're, you're not going to want to miss that. Absolutely. And especially today's episode, we've got some great photos that I think uh, everyone's going to enjoy. And if you happen to miss the preview episode and last week's episode about leaving home, I highly suggest you go back and take a look at it because uh, there was a special guest in uh, our first episode that you'll enjoy, a 91-year-old woman who was alive at the time the troops were shipping out, our mother, Pat Congella. Yeah, she was great, and uh, I, I recommend that as well. Now, Ken, we left off our last episode with Dad arriving by ship in Great Britain. So what's up with this episode? What are we going to see? Yeah, so he's arrived in Great Britain, and he's continuing his training. And we learned uh, in our last episode that he became a sharpshooter uh, in the infantry at that point in time. Um, but then we don't know a lot about what's going on with him, and I'm sure he's even wondering, well, what's my assignment? What am I going to do? Because at Camp Croft, that's a replacement center camp where these guys know they're going in to fill in for for uh, wounded soldiers or soldiers that have, have died. And so I'm sure he's wondering, where am I going to end up? And we're going to take you through where he does end up, which is quite an interesting story. Um, the parallels with where he ends up after the war. And um, we'll take you through his uh, really first uh, two battles of this war, where he uh, really got to see the action up front and, and personal. And uh, we have some great photos of before and after. So before we really get started, Ken, you know, um, just a question that I have, and I'm not sure if you have the answer for this. So these replacement soldiers that are training at Fort Croft, do they get sent a ton of different spaces? Do they, you know, could they go to the same spot? Or are they just going wherever they need help? They go wherever they're needed within their capacity. So if you're an infantryman, you, you could wind up with any group um, as a, as a fill in infantryman. Um, so they have no idea, you know, look, obviously they're in, he's in England. He knows he's going to be in the European theater of operations, um, but he doesn't know what outfit he's going to be with exactly what his assignment's going to be. You're really in the dark. It's uh, it's kind of a scary thing just to be in the war, but not really know what your assignment is. At least you could probably prepare for that down the road. So we know he's in England. We know he's mm -hmm. done some training, but we don't know when he gets attached as a replacement. What do you know about that? Yeah, it's a little unclear. I've been trying to nail it down. I had a phone conversation today with Eric Brune, who heads up the 99th Infantry Battalion's Facebook page, and he's doing some research for me. Um, but sometime between August 30th and October 4th, he ends up joining uh, the uh, folks that he gets assigned to. And, you know, I, I, I'm anxious to tell you about what that group is here in a minute. All right. So what what do we know about this 99th Battalion? OK, so this is the interesting thing. So the 99th Infantry Battalion separate is how they're supposed to be called. We're just going to call them the 99th. I don't want people to get confused with the 99th Infantry Division. That This is a totally separate group, and that's why they had the word separate put at the end of their name for the 99th Infantry Battalion. So this battalion was actually known as the Norwegian Troops. OK, and they were formed in uh, let me just grab some notes here to get these dates right. They were they were formed in uh, July 10th of 1942. There was an order to the commanding general of the Second Army that he was to activate this unit at Camp Ripley, Minnesota. And the unit was to be comprised of uh, Norwegian Americans, immigrants that had, had come to America that had proper papers and they needed to be able to speak Norwegian. 
And the intent was to train these guys to invade Norway because Norway was already occupied by the Nazis. So this was going to be a special group that was going to be trained to go into Norway and fight in winter conditions in Norway. So they start at Camp Ripley in Minnesota. These um, young men, young boys came from far and wide. They could either be raw recruits that had, you know, enlisted like when dad did, they found out they were Norwegian. They'd ask him those questions. They would send them then to Camp Ripley to join that group. Um, they could be seasoned soldiers that were in other areas. It, they, they made announcements that, hey, we need Norwegian speaking troops to, you know, to come join this special unit. So they came from all over. You know, they were guys that were in the Norwegian merchant marines. You know, they were heavily torpedoed when they were moving goods in the North Sea. Um, and, you know, across the English Channel, things like that. They were farm kids from the Midwest. You know, a lot of the Norwegians uh, and uh, the Scandinavians settled in, in the Minnesota area. And that's why they set this first camp up there. So they came from all walks of life. Um, so they're these big Norwegian guys that are kind of a special forces unit. Let me ask you they a start, question about yeah, this. Sure. Because yeah. obviously you want these guys to speak the native language if they're going back to help this country and, right. you know, and, and invade and protect Norway. Yeah. Um, they look the part, right? Do you know right. anything about these guys? If any of them are recent, you know, people that, you know, immigrated to the United States within, you know, five years before the war, or they, they born and raised in the United States. Do you know anything about that? Yeah. And, and I've got guys that could go on and on about that because they're Norwegian descendants of these guys and I'm not. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they, they came from all over. Uh, some were U.S. citizens. Some uh, were newly entered in the United States who were, you know, in the process of getting citizenship. Um, so they really came from all different aspects of, uh, you know, some of them had had fleed uh, Norway to get away from the Nazis yeah. and came to America. So, yeah, it was a, a real mixture of men. Yeah. So they started their training in Minnesota. Did they train anywhere else? Well, they, they're in Minnesota and then kind of organizing the unit. And a, a Captain Hansen was in charge of doing that. And his name will come up a few times in our following of Dad's footsteps. So Captain Hansen is organizing these guys in Camp Ripley. They moved to Fort Snelling, Minnesota to begin their training in September of 1942. And then by December 17th of 1942, um, they pick up and get on the train and they come to Camp Hale, Colorado to train. Interesting. Why is that interesting to our family, Ken? Well, what makes it interesting is uh, it's just up here in Leadville. I, I've been up there. I've snowmobiled up there. And there's a, even a monument up there to the 99th to, uh, to this day between Leadville and Camp Hale on Tennessee Pass. What makes it interesting is dad being an Italian American from Pittsburgh, he gonna, he's going to wind up with these guys. And eventually, after the war, he moves to Denver, Colorado, lives in Englewood, Colorado, you know, where you're born and where I'm raised. And so there's this Colorado connection that is just kind of odd that it happened that way. The guys that he's thrown in with, they trained in Colorado. He didn't know anything about Colorado at the time. And he ends up living the majority of his adult life all the way until his death in Colorado. That's just one of those weird things that happens in only stories like this, right? So exactly. Who else does the 99th train with there in Camp Hill? Yeah. So Camp Hale is, is really famous for the 10th Mountain Division that trained there. Now, now these were American ski troops. They didn't have to be of any certain nationality. So they recruited guys that were excellent downhill skiers. Uh, they came from Vermont, uh, upstate New York, uh, you know, Colorado. Idaho, Montana, wherever there were ski areas. And these guys were recruited to the 10th Mountain Division to train, train at Camp Hale. And their assignment was going to be to go into the Alps uh, in Italy and fight there. So they trained right alongside the 10th Mountain Division. The 10th Mountain Division is more famous, and I'm not exactly sure why it worked out that way, but a lot of the guys that were in the 10th Mountain Division, they're the guys that came back and started the ski areas in Colorado, like Vail. I never knew and that. So, yeah, because they, they they experienced that area right there. And then they came and they started looking around and they started uh, building Vail at that time, you know, after the war. I think in the, I think it's got to be the late 50s, early 60s. Yeah, they right had this vision. That. 
Yeah, yeah. making a ski mountain. So the Tenth Mountain is very famous. There's even a Tenth Mountain whiskey now that's made in Colorado. So uh, it, it, they're they're very famous. And the 99th is kind of like their uh, you know their younger brother didn't get as much notoriety, but they certainly are near and dear to my heart. Yeah, because they're of the important. Story we're about to tell. Yeah, absolutely. They're absolutely. very important yeah. to us. So. After the yeah. 99th did their training there at Camp Hill, where did yeah. they get sent to? Yeah, so they trained at Camp Hill from December until about June. So they did all the winter warfare training through the spring. They And then they had to practice climbing dry mountains. So they, you know, mountain climbing with heavy packs. Um, then they're shipped off to Camp uh, Shanks in New York in August of 1943. They board uh, the SS Mexico on September 5th, 1943. They crossed the Atlantic, like we talked about in the last episode with Dad. It was uneventful for them. They were fortunate about that. They land in Scotland, and then they kind of work their way down through England uh, to Perham Downs Camp in Wiltshire, England. Uh, in September, by mid-January, they go by rail to Wales. Uh, by May 1st, they're in Ludloy near Her Hereford, England. And... Uh, they're uh, at that point doing their final training and they're getting ready for uh, Normandy. They don't go in on the beaches on June 6th, but they go over to Normandy. They leave on June 16th. So they're the reinforcements coming in now that they've got the causeways open. So they go across the English Channel on the uh, 16th and they hit terrible weather and they don't get off the boat on the beaches. They have to just ride it out. Until June 21st, they get off the beaches at Omaha Beach and move inland, and their job then is to go to Sherberg and provide security for those areas that had been captured and make sure there was no counterattacks. Wow, that's crazy. Now, if my math is yeah. correct, it seems like yeah. dad was maybe just a year behind arrival, a little more than a year from when they got to England and started what they were doing, the 99th, that is. And then dad arrived, what, in November the very next year? Is that right? He no, he arrives uh, in England in June of forty four okay. on June sixteenth. Those guys shipped over to Normandy on June seventeenth, but they okay. had been in England since uh, August of right. uh, or September of nineteen forty three. So I did have my math wrong. Sorry about that. But thank not, you for the not clarification. Not by much, though. You know, okay. September nineteen forty three. You know, to June of nineteen forty four is when Dad arrives. So what is that? I don't know, nine months or something okay. like that. So yeah. So we know that dad is going to be one of these replacements. When did he actually physically start doing that work? Where was he sent? What do you know about that? Yeah, so so this has uh, been hard to kind of track down. But I, but in in this uh, book that, that's uh, dad had after the war, it's a book about the history of the 99th Infantry Battalion separate written by a PFC Howard Bergen. And I found a lot of good information there. In that book, it says on August 30th that the uh, – uh, 99th received replacements. So I'm thinking dad probably arrived then because, I mean, he was more than ready. He'd been in, in England since June. So he's had, you know, three more months of training. He's probably ready to go. I would imagine he would be one of the first ones they shipped out. So I think he went. And the reason he had to go is that the 99th had had a pretty significant battle at Elba, France in uh, August, on August 25th. And during that battle, the uh, the battalion commander, a lieutenant, lieutenant Colonel R.G. Turner, was wounded, and the uh, executive officer was uh, Captain Hansen, who started in Camp Ripley to organize the troops. So C Camp Ripley is the XO. I'm sorry, uh, Colonel Hansen or Major Hansen at the time, or Captain at the time. I'm sorry, he gets promoted or has to move up and start to to manage the troops, and he was well liked by the guys because he had been there since day one. So at that battle, they had nine officers wounded uh, from shelling that hit the command center. Nine officers wounded, seven enlisted men were killed, and 41 were wounded in the 99th. So there's a, a strong need for replacements at that point. So I'm assuming Dad joined them uh, you know, around August 30th. I could be wrong, and we'll find out later, and we'll clarify that, but I don't have the answer yet. Do you have any estimation how big uh, the 99th separate was? How many men? <sighs> that's, a, that's a great question. I, I don't know. Um, Maybe I, someone will I, put I, it in our comments, someone that might know. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and of it. absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I don't know exactly the size of it. I, you know, I would guess it was, uh, I'm going to guess that it was probably uh, 800 guys, yeah. maybe. Would so be a about smaller the size. force. Um, yeah. Because they're specialized, yeah. right? So they're exactly. taking some losses. And then, right. you know, they're going to have to call these these uh, replacements. Right. What yep. do you know about the this canal drive battle I heard about? 
Yeah. So, you know, I, I think about dad getting thrown in as, in as a replacement and it's always hard for these replacements to go in. And it had to be especially hard for him because think about it. The 99th it, it are these Norwegian guys and, you know, Scandinavians are usually tall, you know, blonde haired kind of guys. Dad's this, you know, Italian American, um, first, you know, generation born in America. Um, and he's five foot six. And he gets thrown in with these guys, and I'm sure that was a bit of a shock to his system, you know. And and I think it was hard for guys that had trained since 1942, since in 1943, to have these guys come in that didn't go through the training with them. They were probably, you know, on the on the outside a lot until they kind of earned their stripes. Yeah, with we've these seen existing that. guys. We've seen that in movies and television shows yeah. where they, you know, they're they're trusted because they're there to help, but they're not part of the family yet. And of course, no. these guys, these Norwegian you know, Americans are speaking, what is it, Dutch? You know, Norwegian. Norwegian. Yeah. 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 So they're they're yeah. speaking this language too, because that's why they were so special. That's why we're there. So, right. you know, so they're speaking English and that. And and then, you know, dad has to kind of navigate that. But it seems like yeah. he did okay getting in there. He did. He did. And uh, if I'm right about him getting in there on August 30th, he would have been there just in time to join them for what is known as the canal drive right now, which occurred on September 14th of 1944. The uh, troops of the 99th is called into action in Mechelen, Belgium. And dad, from what we have learned, is in the C Company. And, and in the book that I showed you, the C Company is attached to the 2nd Battalion of the 66th Armored Regiment. So they've got tanks. They had five light tanks and six medium tanks for this mission to go into this area of Belgium and clear out the Germans. It's called the canal drive because there's a canal there and I'm not going to pronounce it right, but it's the, the Willis Vart canal. And I'm sure I'm saying it's wrong, probably Villas because it's a W. And if, if it comes from a German name, it's the Villas Vart canal, V A A two A's V A A R T canal. And so they're having to drive along this canal to, to get rid of the Germans and um, C company comes under, terrific fire because we're getting close to Germany now and uh, and the, the Germans are well entrenched here and so they come under heavy mortar and artillery fire and machine gun fire and so A, B and D companies from the 99th are called into action they cross the canal and join with the C company and you know the rest of the armored folks and they fight in the canal area from uh, the 16th to the 18th of September and when I was in Europe I had a chance to visit that area just briefly because I had a lot on my agenda that day and uh, I was able to find uh, a, a, what I feel is pretty close to the spot where there's a picture in the book, uh, the, the history book here, of the C Company uh, marching the uh, German prisoners along the canal after they had taken them prisoner. And so I was able to walk that canal myself. And, you know, there's some old houses along there that, you know, were there in 1944. And so I really felt like, well, if dad was a replacement at that point, he probably walked this same canal and is looking at very similar things to the to what i was seeing at that point in time yeah i mean that was his first action and and may not have been your first thing that you saw but maybe you really took it in and that wow this is this is where my father was right yes yeah it just really kind of hits home and uh you know it gave me a taste for for where he was and then as i got further and further into the battles that were even bloodier um it really uh hit home with me that man he he was in some some tight spots yeah, you know, growing up, as I said in our preview episode, I always thought he was relatively safe and set for one or two stories that he shared with us. But right. what you probably learned, he was in the in the thick of it. What happens after the, the canal drive, uh, you know, uh, battle and, and what was going on there? Yeah. So, OK, so so they uh, they're there the 16th to the 18th. And uh, in that action alone, uh, they they had one officer killed. Uh, two officers were wounded, eight enlisted men killed. 75 wounded and 10 missing in action, but they took 440 German prisoners. Wow. So they, they were very successful there. And uh, there's even a quote in the book that the, the, the tank guy said, this is the only infantry unit that we had trouble keeping up with. They were moving down that canal so fast. So they, they were a, a special force for sure. Yeah. I mean, that's special to us and special to the army. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, you know, they wrap up that campaign and they get a chance to uh, to rest. And uh, they so they they pull back from the front lines and they can rest for a bit, but not very long because uh, their rest came to an abrupt halt on October 12th of 1944. And now the big push into Germany is starting. So the battalion is now attached to the 19th Corps and then the 30th uh, Infantry Division. And they had a special mission. Um there's a town in Germany called Aachen, which is a fairly sizable town. I visited it. Um, I would equate it to, if you're familiar with Colorado, it'd be like Colorado Springs-ish, okay? All right. So the, it had already been under attack before Dad's group was called up there. The 99th was called up there. And the, uh, the, the U.S. troops had basically encircled Aachen, except for one little gap that went with, through this little German town called Versalen. And it's spelled with a W, but you say Versalin. So there's this little town of Versalin, and there's a, a roadway that runs through Versalin to Cologne, Germany. So that roadway is still open. So the Germans are able to bring in supplies and fresh troops and send out their wounded. And so our commanders were like, look, if we close that gap, we've got them trapped in Aachen. We can take Aachen entirely, and so we've got was a their- foothold. That was their main part of resupplying their troops. Is that just that one, one That's, road? Yeah. If you look at a map of it, uh, Chris, you, you'll see it, it's like it's like a cul-de-sac, you know, yeah. and they've got them encircled and there's just one way out. And uh, that the one way out is is what dad had to go in and, and close the gap on. And what's interesting about this battle, and I, I'm 99.9% sure he had to be there because in the in this book, he specifically took in a in a red pencil and he marked Worcelin on it. So I knew it meant a lot to him. And I always wondered why he marked it. And when I dove into it deeper and, and I could understand why why he marked it the way he did. That's that's remarkable. And you know, yeah. as smart as our, you know, forces are about knowing we got to cut off this line, I'm sure the Germans say we have to protect this road. This is our only way of doing it. So you know they're waiting, you know, in in ready for us, right? They were firmly entrenched there. They they had established uh, pillboxes there. They had uh, machine gun nests. Um, it was going to be a tough, tough way to go. And, you know, you're fighting on German ground now. And men fight differently when it's their home country. So it was heavily and viciously defended by the Germans. And so during my European trip, I was fortunate enough before I went to meet this man. Uh, his name is Volker. I won't use his last name um, for his privacy reasons, but he's a he's a very interesting guy, and he uh, he's he's unique in the fact that he's he's a German man. He's in his mid forties. His grandfather, talk about you know our World War II dad. This is his World War II grandfather on the German side was a paratrooper for the Germans, and he had fought in Russia. Uh, a, a number of years, he was wounded twice in Russia. He was hit by shrapnel once, and he was bayoneted in the calf another time. And so I, I, I talked to Volker, and I said, you know, why are you interested in this? And he goes, well, because of my grandfather, I got interested. And then I read the history, and he said, my grandfather was not a Nazi. He, you know, he was forced to fight. And he goes, so I don't have any allegiance to what the Nazis were doing at that point in time. He goes, so I read about the Americans. And he, as I read about it, he said, I learned more and more about them. And I, I kind of came to, you know, feel their cause, even though it's my own country. And this man, Folker, he takes care of six graves at the Henri Chapelle Cemetery in Belgium, six American graves. He tends to them. Then he got so interested, he became a World War II reenactor. Hmm. And, and he owns a, a World War II Jeep. He's got the uniform, the rations. He's got as, has an imitation uh, machine gun that mounts to the Jeep. So uh, he, he and I arranged it that we could meet. He picks me up in the Jeep and he, he's like, are you ready? I'm like, yeah. He's like, okay. He gets out an army map that shows all the positions. He's done all this research for me because I told him, you know, who my dad was and that he was in the C company, the 99th. He's done all this research. He spreads the map out on top of this Jeep. And he's like, okay, this is where we are. And this is where we're going to go. We're going to see exactly where your dad was during the three most intense days of the battle. And I'm like, dude, let's do this. You know, yeah, I'm no so kidding. excited. I can't believe it, you know? And what a what a great guy. So uh, it starts to rain, and uh, my wife's with me, Dawn, 
and she has a raincoat on, but her legs are getting wet. She's sitting in the back of the Jeep, you know, and this is a Jeep just like dad drove, you know, yeah. I mean, it's identical to what dad drove. So I give her my raincoat and Fulker pulls out a World War II raincoat, puts that on me, and then he throws a helmet on me, a U.S. helmet on me to, you know, to sit out the rain. And so I was getting the full experience from Fulker. So we head off in the Jeep and uh, he takes me to all the sites. Wow, what a generous uh, man with his time and uh, and a love for our country and a love for what our guys did there. Yeah, you know it's it's remarkable because you come across a lot of these 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 guys that you know that fought in World War II that yeah. had, were forced to right. They weren't right. they weren't bad guys, and it you know no. makes it difficult to think about the atrocities on both sides when you run yeah. into somebody like that. But what a great uh, guide to take you places and, oh. and, and show you all these things. Yeah. Now, yeah. Um, what, what kind of things else did he show you? So b- before I jump into that, I just want to f- close the circle on his, his grandfather. So just sure. to finish the story on his grandfather. So after the Russian conflict, he heals up and he gets shipped off to San Lo, which is in Normandy. And he's there, uh, when D-Day happens. So he's fighting in San Lo. The Americans push them back and he's pushed back to this uh, town of, called Brest in France, which is on, up on the peninsula there. And he's actually taken prisoner of war. Hmm. Um, so he's taken prisoner of war in I forget the exact date, but it's in, in 1944, probably July, maybe August. And he, they send him off to England. He's in a prisoner of war camp, which probably saved his life. Yeah. He's in a prisoner of war camp to the end of the year or to the end of the war. And he comes back and he becomes a tailor and lives his life peacefully the rest of his life. Wow. Yeah, that's interesting, incredible. interesting. So another, another, you know, our, our World War II. That's his World War II yeah. grandfather. Yeah, so crazy. anyway, so 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 Falker gets me in the jeep, and we and we take off through Worcelin. And uh, he had a bunch of uh, old black and white photos that he had researched. And uh, the first photo he shows me is this uh, American soldier. And I don't know if he's in Dad's company or not, but um, in, in his research, he knew Dad's company had come through this same place, so it could be. A member of the 99th, we're not sure, but this is American soldier, and he's in the doorway, and it's kind of a sunken doorway. It's like it must be like go down to a basement doorway. He's in the doorway of this building, and he's got his gun out, and he's he's looking up the road, and uh, the you know the building's brick with this red trim on it and everything, and uh, so he drives us up there, and he stops the jeep, and he goes, "Look, look to your left," and I look to my left, and. Chris, the building had not changed a bit. I mean, you know, some of the grass had grown up differently and there might be a fence here and there, but the building was unchanged. That doorway was unchanged. And I walked over there and stood right where that soldier was. And, and Folker tells me what the soldier's looking at is a tank that's up the road. He has a picture of the tank up the road as well. So it was great to be able to see um, that building exactly as it was, and then to go stand exactly where that soldier was and experience what it had to be like at that time. So when you're standing in that area, how far was that tank away? Could you see anything that would trigger that for you in modern day? Yeah. So Folker pointed out to me, he said, you know, if you look up here towards that, to this yellow house that was up the street and their houses are built attached and, you know, they kind of you know, go like around the townhouse, the kind of a whole yeah. kind of row house. Or- like a row house. Yeah. yeah. And they were probably, you know, three stories high. And he said, if you see that yellow one up there, he goes, that's where the, where the tank was. And then he gives me the black and white picture of the tank. And it's an, it's a knocked out German tank. It's, it's, you know, smoke still coming out of it. And in that picture, there's two soldiers, one on the right-hand side in the, in the hedges, you know, kind of looking up, is it safe to move up? And then another soldier's on the left-hand side of the street, you know, behind the building kind of looking around. And so he was able to show us exactly where that happened as well. So it was fascinating to see the before and after of those photos. Since you were there and, you know, photos are great to see, but you can't really tell the distance, right? Yeah, how much? Right. How far do you think that tank was away from that soldier? Would you say a football field? Um, maybe two hundred yards. Okay, maybe two, two to three hundred yards. It, it was, yeah, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't far. Okay, um, so it had to be, you know, they weren't. I don't know if they knew if it was completely knocked out. And then the funny thing is, the road kind of curved a little bit. So even though the tank's knocked out, what's behind the next curve of the road? And one of the interesting things that occurred to me when I was there is, is do you remember dad telling the story about when, you know, he was a, what they called a messenger that's in his, his paperwork and it shows that he was a messenger and then a Jeep driver. So it's a messenger, they're called runners. And so what a runner does is he's given a, a message by 
you know, the command to say, hey, take this message. You got to get it down to this sergeant and tell him this is what we want him to do. So dad's got this message and he tells the story that uh, he was ready to take it. So he inquires where the guys are. And somebody goes, yeah, they're, you know, they're down down this way. And the and dad says, OK, have we cleared this sector? Is, it, is this a good route to go? And the guy goes, yeah, you're fine. Go ahead and, you know, go down that way. So dad says he, he took off running. And this is what I pictured in my mind when I was at this location. He takes off running and there's houses on one side and a field on the other side. He's running right along the houses and a machine gun from on the other side of the field opens up on him. And, and he just hears, you know, that sound of that MG42 coming at him. And he said the first doorway he got into, the door was open and he just dove in to, to get safety. What he didn't realize is it was a door to a basement, just like that picture of the man standing in the doorway. That was a basement door. He dives straight out, but there's stairs going down. So, you know, you dive this way, but the ground's dropping below you. So he dove all the way into the basement. He uh, he hurt his, his wrist or his thumb at the time. And I said, what did you do? He goes, well, he goes, I, I kind of waited till it got dark. And he goes, after it got dark, he goes, I was able to move up the street and deliver the message. But I remember as a kid when we'd ride on his back on his back and he'd give us piggybacks. Yeah, he would never put his hand flat on the ground. He'd always make a fist because that wrist hurt him. And that's and that's why that wrist always bothered him. So those are the memories that flooded back to me when I pictured him in that same situation as that is that soldier in the doorway at 18. Maybe he ran up that road. It was probably a road similar to that where they opened up you know uh, firing at him and he did what his instinct said to do which was to dive in the first opening you could get to and hide out that's crazy all right yeah. so we're running out of time here a little bit so let's okay let's what's going on with the rest of uh auckland and in that battle and what happens afterwards? Okay, so so Aachen is is encircled. So we're trying to close the gap on Worsalin, and so we're hitting it hard with mortars, etc. So one of the one of the things they had to do was the Germans were were held up in uh, Saint Sebastian Church, and so we had to mortar the heck out of that thing. And so uh, Folker shows me a picture of the church, just basically destroyed and then he drives me in the jeep right to this same church and and it's been rebuilt in the same format but you can still see you know the battle damage on the corners that were the original cornerstones are still there you can see all the battle damage still on it and uh, the americans just pounded the heck out of that church and uh, and got the germans out of there um so that was an important part of the battle then the next thing Folker shows me is we, we drive out into this field and it's this beautiful yellow field, peaceful birds are singing, he drives me out in this field. And he says, this is the bloody Ravelsburger. And I'm like, what do you mean? This is a beautiful field. They're growing mustard seed. They call it rapeseed over there. And it's just this beautiful green field. And, and I go, what do you mean by bloody Ravelsburger? He says, well, the street was called Ravelsburger. And he said, your father is down the hill from here down in these trees and he's got to attack up this hill and and move the germans out of there in order to close off the road and uh, he goes you can see that the germans had great visibility from they up had the high, high ground right they had they, the high ground yeah who yeah. <laughs> wants to yeah. go up against that exactly so uh so dad's troops were able to do it they had some armored support they worked their way up that but it was a, a bloody battle battle and it's referred to as the bloody ravelsburger now you know, it's 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 hauntingly beautiful, right? There are all these yellow flowers or whatever yeah. that is, and yeah, and you're just you're on this landscape that hasn't really changed since Dad was there, right? No. Yeah, that's what's fascinating about it. Um, in, in a lot of Europe, we saw that that things hadn't changed that much. You know, they changed so fast here in America, but they didn't change that much there. So we're looking out on this, you know, beautiful field, and I'm looking down into these trees. Now there's some homes built back there and stuff like that. But when he drove me down there, you know, we got in the trees and we could we could look up and see, and it, it's exactly what I'm sure he saw. A lot more peaceful than what he was yeah. facing, but uh, yeah, he he saw a lot at that point. Was there any other remnants from the war that you saw? Any kind of like you know, I don't know, not pillboxes where you know they're in caves or any of that kind of rocks or anything with yeah. you know that kind of stuff. Yeah, so so Folker, he he loves to go out in his jeep on the weekends and drive some drive around, and he knows the locals. He got to know some folks through his girlfriend, and they said, yeah, you got to come look at our property. There's an old bunker on it. 
and it's a destroyed bunker, but he took us through it and kind of explained how the bunkers work. And it's really fascinating. Um, and uh, so I crawled in there and I, I kind of looked through the, the gun ports and then I walked around front and I, you know, I, I, I looked at the, the panorama of what it looks like across these fields of fire. And just imagine, of course, it's always on the high ground, right? Right. And just imagine the troops having to come up through those fields. And I, I said to Volker, I said, it must have just been a massacre. Massacre, and he said your your guys you know tested the defenses and found out it was fairly formidable. So they kind of did an end around um, and said we'll deal with that later, and we can kind of work our way and flank them from the other side. And so that was interesting. And I asked him, I said, what other defenses were there? And he says, well, he goes, this is interesting. After the end of World War One. Uh, both Germany and France start to build uh, defensive barriers across their borders. And there's something called the Siegfried Line, which is fairly famous. And it extends from really Aachen, which is in northern Germany, all the way down to Basel, Switzerland. And, and it's a series of defenses. And a lot of these defenses are these concrete uh, barriers that are called dragon's teeth. And they kind of look like that. And, uh, what they're designed to do, as Volker explained it to me, is they're designed so that when a, a tank approaches them, you know, they'll run up on it and expose their soft underbelly, maybe get stuck on it, or at least expose themselves to being shot through that soft underbelly. And so we were able to see the remnants of those that are still there. Um, you know, they're made out of heavy duty concrete. They've got moss and stuff growing on them now, but they were they were quite quite the defense mechanism. Wow. So what were the final numbers of that battle? What was there a lot of loss? Did we take some prisoners? What happened? Yeah, so so they you know they were able to they were able to close the circle around Aachen and, and cut the Germans off, um, which paved the way for us to head towards Cologne. And of course, we you know we captured a lot a lot of prisoners at that point in time. Um, and the 99th had been on the front line for nine days. And uh, the final place that that Volker took us was he, we drove up this hill and he says, okay, we got to get out and walk a little bit. So we're on the highest point between Aachen and Worsaland and it's a place called Crucifix Hill. And it's got this giant crucifix on it. It was there when dad fought that it's oh, wow. been a crucifix. The same one, huh? Yeah. Yeah. It's been there for a long time. And so he, he took us up there and he says, he says, look around. He goes, here's Aachen. Here's Worsaland. Here's the road between them that your dad had to shut down in order to keep the German troops from resupplying and to capture them. And uh, he, he says, you can see how important this high ground was. It was highly contested. And uh, the, of course, the American troops finally prevailed, took that high ground, closed the gap on Aachen and uh, took a lot of German uh, prisoners at that point in time. And the real feather in the cap for the 99th is that when Aachen was completely captured, uh, the 99th and, and the counterparts they fought with, they were known as the group that captured the first significant city in Germany during World War II and gained a foothold. And I'm sure those young men were thinking, oh, we got, we're in Germany now, we got a foothold, we're on our way to Berlin, we'll be there by Christmas. And our dad was there. That's incredible. Did they go to Berlin next? Well, they wanted to, but they uh, they needed to come off the lines and rest and refit for a little bit. Um, so they they were taken off the lines and trucks, moved to another location to to rest up. And um, then they were thinking about Berlin, but they were in for a bit of a surprise. Wow, that's incredible. You know, when we uh, when we have to leave it there, it's, it's sad. But when we return for our next episode. We're going to check in on the 99th and see if they got that much needed rest. And then it's geared up. Here come the rampage for our World War II dad. Thanks for watching and listening to our World War II dad. Please remember to like and subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you don't miss an episode. And if you're just listening to the podcast, please leave us a five-star review. We would really appreciate it.